said, you can't say about me. <laughs> but I said, you know, the kids all have this story they love to tell that their Uncle Irving, Danny's father, always said, you know, my brother Laurie is so clever that he can remember things from before his birth. <laughs> I said, Carol, he has to tell that story. And he did. <laughs> and Lawrence, if you listen carefully, my story begins long before my birth. <laughs> he was a kind, gentle gentleman. He was mild-mannered. He had a great sense of integrity and honesty. He was hard-working, entrepreneurial, always a broad smile on his face. He loved his shul, and he loved his Jewishness. That was my dad, Roger. Fiery, tough, kind, but compassionate progressive thinker, and some people said a dynamic individual, a woman who knew where she was going and always did what she wanted. And that was Ruckel or Rose, my mother. My father was one of four boys. There was Laser, his eldest brother, who's Leonard Charles' grandfather, and whom I'm named after. His middle brother, Moses, Mervyn Greenberg, and his sister Jen's dad. He was the middle brother. And there was my father. Roger. And they had an older brother who never came to Canada. His name was Lace, um, Yussel. My mother, she came from a much larger family. My mother was one of 18 or 21 children. Now one might ask, well, why the discrepancy between 18 and 21? Well, my grandfather's first wife died at the age of 40, and all the children were hers. And she was the only one, apparently, who had the real count. <laughs> My grandfather never kept count. But there were eight sisters and one brother who survived who came to this country. And I can recall over the years the debate between my mother and her sisters about how many kids were there. One was born, supposedly, when it was snowy and it was near Christmas. One was, it was near Hanukkah. But the one thing was for sure, they knew that nine lived. But the number really never was sorted out. And so, for all the years, we always joked about the small family, 18 or 21. <laughs> My mother's family were based in Montreal, and except for one cousin who lives in Canada and Ottawa till this very day, cousin Clara Slack. All of them lived in Montreal. The Greenberg family tree, as I said to someone walking in here this evening, is a rather small tree, sort of shocked someone. The tree consists of my father and his siblings, their offspring, and there were a few marriages in between cousins. And two branches formed, the Soloways and the Genters. And that was it. A small tree, but a sturdy one, one we're very proud of. And in 1915, Lawrence Long, before I was born, <coughs> Roger Greenberg and Rose Bazumni left Russia and came to the shores of Canada, the land of hope, opportunity, supposedly the land of milk and honey. And shortly after their arrival, they were married. And so began the journey of the Rose and Roger Greenberg story. They began their life in the city, living in the lower town area, in a street that still exists, St. Andrew. And from that time on and through to the 1920s, approaching the 1930s, they lived in St. Andrew, they moved to Billingsbridge. My father was a peddler. And like most people, they had uh, some difficulties. First of all, it was a new country, a new language. Governments to understand the structure, how to operate, how to live, how do you earn a living. It was all foreign to them, but they weren't unique. Everyone went through the same experiences. But my dad, who was an opportunist, my mother, who was a hardworking woman, they slugged through the difficult years, and some of them were harder than others. And somewhere in the mid-1920s, my father became an ill man. Consumption. TB, as it's known today. And that set my father back quite a bit. And off to a sanatorium in Montreal, where he was cared for. And the story goes, my mother ran back and forth to Montreal regularly to try to help the institution bring my father back to good health. So my dad's siblings and my mother's pitched in, and after a period of time, my father came back to Ottawa, back to work, and back to the grind. You see, they now had 
five living children, but my mother had six by then. We'd lost my oldest brother, older than my brother Lou, in a tragic accident up in Billings Bridge in one of the farms. And so, up until the latter part of the 1920s, there were five living children. My oldest brother Lou, my sister Jen, my brother Gilbert, my sister Grace, and my brother Ernie. Well, times, they tell us, were good, and they were difficult. But my father was a peddler, targeted the Ottawa South Glebe area as his market area. The people were predominantly English. They were of a better educated strata of society, and their incomes were quite good. And so my father decided that might be the proper place to peddle. Chances of selling his products were better. And along the way, he met some very fine people. And one of the names that keeps cropping up in our family was the former mayor of Ottawa, George Nelm, George Nelm's family. His father apparently was a very fine fella. I don't know what happened to George. <laughs> and they introduced my father to a thing called the stock market. They said, you know, Roger, my dad has a big smile. If you have an extra few dollars from your peddling, invest it in the stock market. It might supplement your income. And my father went back to my mother, and there was always a decision that had to be made by my mother. <laughs> And they decided they'd make some small investments on the good days into the stock market. Well, we know what happened in the 20s. The depression and the crash. And crash went our family. But my father and mother were optimists. And in 1930 or so, they opened a new business, a grocery store. They're now called convenience stores, entrepreneurs. They're entrepreneurs as well. And they made a fairly good living there. It was located at the bank, corner of Bank and Belmont. Some of you might know that place. It's where the Trillium Baker now exists. And for the next few years, life apparently was quite good. Their living came along. The clients came to the store. Incomes were coming in. My brothers and sisters were in school. Some at Hopewell, some at others, and others, excuse me, and others. But as they approached 1933 and they entered into 1933, two very important events took place. One, I was born. <laughs> that was a major event. <laughs> and the second event was one that affected the entire population. The birth of the supermarkets. And that made life difficult for the small shop owners. It made it easier shopping for the general public, a new way of merchandising food. And shortly after Loblaws opened, which is just a few doors up the street from where my dad's store was, one of dad's customers came in and said to my father that he went to the opening the day before and he saw that sardines were selling for less than my dad's were. And my dad listened carefully and the gentleman went on and his wife said, well, you know, we've enjoyed you. You've been a very fine gentleman and we've enjoyed your family. But we're going to have to change our shopping habits, unfortunately. And the gentleman left with his wife, and my dad turned to my mother and said, Ketzla, that was his name for my mother, Pussycat, I guess, and said, I want to go to Loblaws for a moment. And he took off his apron, my mother took care of the counter. My dad walked into Loblaws, and sure enough, sardines, selling for less than what my father paid for them. And he walked around the store and looked at other products that were on his own shelf. And again, the same story was told. Selling price, less than my father's purchasing price. And so he came back to the store and said to his wife, Rachel, it's time to wind down the store. We can't compete. My father never took a bad seat. My mother wouldn't have allowed it. And so, back to peddling. Back to the same neighborhood. And things moved along fairly well. Difficult, but fairly well. By this time, my oldest brother, Lou, was becoming a teenager. That's Lawrence's dad, David's dad. And he started to help his father. He was an ex-student, by the way. And just in case you young fellows don't know about your father, my other brothers and sisters always said that the brightest one in our family was your father. He was in grade nine at the age of 11. But he had other, other characteristics. His working habits were a little less, you see. <laughs> 
But Lou is one of those good sons and he helped his dad and his mom, and that way the rest of the family, trying to earn a living as he attended school. Well, they had to move out of Belmont, and they moved just a few blocks away to a street called Monk. Monk is in the same area. And I remembered two things about Monk Street. One was my brother Irving and my sister Grace doing their homework at the kitchen table. I remember working on maps. And the second thing I remember is that when I drove my kitty car, I could drive it into my garage. And the garage was underneath my mother's sink, the kitchen cupboard. Now, those are the two stories I remember very clearly. Now, it tells you how old I was when we moved into Monk Street. And my dad continued the peddling days. And then, a little later on in the, in the 20s, the kids were growing older. They needed more room to move, and so they decided they needed a new location to live in. And besides, Monk Street was difficult for my father to peddle. See, my dad knew that he was spending too much time at the wholesalers making his purchases, and that took away from his time hitting the streets, as my dad called it, knocking the door, selling his product. You know, buying was no difficulty. It was the selling. It was the income. And so they went to look for a new residence, and they came to Blackburn Avenue in Sandy Hill. Now, I can remember Blackburn Avenue because of two things. I don't remember the upstairs, the bedrooms or the kitchen layout, but I remember we had a big basement, big basement, high ceilings, and it was full of fruit and vegetables. That was the the dispatching area of the Roger Greenberg peddling business. And I remember right across the street, Blackburn wasn't built up yet. There was a large farm. It must have been, I don't know, 50 acres, 100 acres, a couple of blocks at least. And from Blackburn Avenue, my dad did quite well because he would go down to the wholesalers. He would buy his product, a little larger volume than most other peddlers who mainly kept their, their goods on the truck. And my dad spent less time at the wholesaler and more, more time on the road knocking doors and selling. And his income improved. But on one of his visits to visit one of my mother's 18 or 21 <laughs> children, one of the eight living sisters and brothers, there was an Uncle Morris. He was one of my mother's sister's husbands. He was Clara Slack's father. One wouldn't describe as the hardest working gentleman, but he was a junk peddler. And I'll tell you what a junk peddler is in a moment. And he convinced or attempted to convince my mother and father that maybe they should leave the peddling business and there might be greater dollars to be earned if you became a junk dealer. Parents thought about it for a short while and thought, well, that might be possibly the route to go. The next stage in the peddling was to become a, a wholesaler. That took a great deal of capital. It was beyond their means. And so they looked for another new location. They had their specs. First of all, it had to be a large home. And so they moved. They moved to, moved to a neighborhood which is known as the Annex to Rockcliffe, just beyond the fringe. <laughs> La Bosville, Sandy Hill, the lower town. The address, 370 Clarence. Well, let me tell you about Clarence Street before I tell you about the junk dealer. Clarence Street had a large home. My brother-in-law is remembers it well. He used to date my older sister, Jen. Those were his lucky days. <laughs> but it was a large home. My mother had a great flair for color. Maybe his remembers. A flashy blue and a flashier dark blue. It was like a Christmas tree. It was like a Hanukkah bush. And everyone knew where the Greenbergs lived, if not by address, certainly by color. And the house was large, as I say, but it had another facility that was extremely important. It had a large backyard and a barn, an unused barn. And that was ideal. It was a place where my father could store some of his product that he brought home from junk dealing, keep in storage, and again, stop him that difficulty of wasting time not on the road, earning a living. But let me tell you just a few things about Karen Street. Like most other homes, we didn't have a concrete basement. We had an earth floor. And the house was heated by, by coal. We had a coal bin in the basement, and I remember those days. And my mother, who was always concerned until her last day about my father's health and the fear of a reoccurring of the disease, decided on her own 
as usual, that my father was not to shovel coal into the furnace. In the day he had a pedal, and at night he had a rest, because rest was important for his health. And even though her children were becoming somewhat older and they could help, Lou was a car salesman by now. He was working at Myers, and he started even before it was known as Myers Motors. My sister Jen was now at Slover's. Breaking home good paychecks, I can tell you. She decided the children and the other kids who were in students, they weren't permitted to shovel cold in the evening hours either. Because they had a rest. They had a clear mind. They needed a clear mind to study, to work, whatever it was. And so mother took on the responsibility. Raising all these children, difficult times, but during the evening hours when we were all well tucked under our blankets, mom went down and shoveled the cold. <coughs> Another story with my mother. Again, it relates to health. In those days, and we have a witness to it here, Mr. Cantor in the back. I can confirm the story because one day in Israel, his brother Banish told me it was a true story because we talked about it. You see, in those days, the Cantors and the other kosher butchers, all very honorable people, of course, <laughs> would take their meat products and they would ship them to the various homes, the Jewish community, and they would wrap them in newspapers. They would take the raw meat rapid in daily newspapers. Now, you know those newspapers came from. The junk dealers, the peddlers, or the horses. One wouldn't call them the cleanest, you know, wrapping material. And my mother said, you know, I put up with this for enough years. He's shaking his head. As a matter of fact, my mother very seldom went to the store. She had hers delivered. And she spoke to the counters and said, I can't accept this any longer. I want craft paper to be wrapped around my meat, then wrapped in newspapers, and then delivered. Well, the canters, you know, they sort of, at first, hey, hey, I mean, that's quite a demand. Well, my mother persisted and said, look at very carefully, and this was in Jewish, I'm sure. If there's no craft paper, Loblaws just want a new client. I'll go to the local rabbi, and I'll tell the Jewish community, and we'll see. Well, they still wrap their paper in craft. They heard there's meat in craft paper. And so my mother won the day. And well, the junk dealer story. Well, what does a junk dealer do for those of you who are too young and might not know? Today we call them recyclers. The fancy name, the laid laws. <laughs> a junk dealer was an individual who went out with a horse and a buggy or a motorized vehicle. My dad always had a truck. And they would go into this city neighborhoods or they'd go into the countryside. My father preferred the countryside because he felt the picking was better, the markets were larger. And they would pick up items that they felt could be recycled. There was scrap iron, there were metals, there were rags, there were bags, horsehair, cow hides. Anything that they thought had a recyclable value was what they picked up. And they bought them from feed dealers and farmers and country garages and they brought them back to their their hometowns and Ours was Ottawa, and now they had to be sold. And the largest scrap dealer in town then was Harvey Glatt's grandfather, old Louis Baker, one of the fine families of our community, a very honorable man. He gave every dealer who came to his shop an honest deal. And my father would sell all of his scrap iron, these old batteries and the metals and the bags and the rags to Baker and got his fare compensation for him, then he'd go out again and pick up another load. And shortly after he got into the business, he realized that quite possibly his income could increase if he found a source where he could sell some of his products at a price somewhat higher than Baker Brothers. And the one commodity that he latched on was his feed bag and the sugar bag and the onion bag product that he was picked up the countryside. You see, it was more easily stored the capital output was less than for the other commodities, and there was a market not far from Ottawa in Montreal. And so my father decided with his sons that that's what he was going to do. He was going to start shipping to Montreal. They found out the names of the dealers and found out that they wanted them in quantity. And so my father would store for a period of six to eight weeks at a time, sometimes shorter if the peddling was better, and they'd have sufficient volume to load transport tractor trailer trucks full of old, used, dirty bags, sorted into number one quality, number two quality, which meant small holes, and scrap, which means 
they were unusable. And they would ship them to Montreal to their dealers. There was only one wish always, that the, chuck, the check in return for the volume was greater than the amount of money they paid for the load. In my father's case, he was fortunate. I remember the name of one particular dealer. The checks that came in were always larger than what my dad had paid for the load. And so it was a wise decision. The highs went elsewhere. But Baker got the major load for my father's endeavors. And as I said, by this time, Lou was well into this car sales business. He was a very, very successful car salesman. My sister, Jen, was at Oakley's, as, at Slover's, the department store in the market area. And I can remember the stories that Jen always brought her paycheck home, always helped her parents. I didn't know, know what or understand it in those days. My happy moments were because she brought me home toys. And for those of you who don't know who I'm referring to, Lauren Slover. <clears throat> Lauren Slover is one of part of that Slover family store. Arnie Slover's younger brother, that some of you might know, was part of that family. 1939, the outbreak of the Second World War. And its immediate effects didn't hit our family. And around 1940, my brother Gilbert, who always worked very closely with his dad, <coughs> was called to the side by his father and he was told he was going to be able to have his own truck, his first used truck. Well, I can, I can remember that conversation. And my father said, when you get the truck, son, of course this was all in Yiddish. You know, you're going to be able to put your own name on the truck. Can you imagine Gilbert Greenberg, dealer, and we still have a family picture of that. There's Gilbert with a big smile and my brother Irving in his <laughs> teenage schlepty clothes and sorting bags and me with my happy little face sitting in the truck window as the camera was snapped. But my dad had purpose behind that acquisition. It wasn't only to help his income, but he wanted to give Gilbert some added responsibility. Because with the truck went responsibilities. There was its maintenance, its upkeep, paying off the cost of the used truck, insurance, all the things that go with ownership. And at the end of those payments, you had to make sufficient money to cover all your costs to have a few extra dollars. And Gilbert, of course, accepted it because Gilly always was that kind of a son. And he always made the load pay. And I can recall one particular incident with Gilly and that truck. It was approaching darkness. And Gilbert was coming down Clarence Street with his load and it seemed like a full load. But as we looked out, there was an Ottawa police cruiser following him. See, Gilbert had a large load on, and on that truck was a large piece of steel, which was large, larger and longer than the length of his truck. And then, you know, if you see a farmer plowing his field with the plow, cutting up the earth, Gilbert's long piece of steel was carving up a municipal street. Well, the police stopped him, and they had their conversation. And then, my two older brothers are called to the services. Both go into the Air Force. By the way, this isn't part of the Greenberg clan, but my brother-in-law, Izzy, also served. I always told Izzy, I, did. I thank him for protecting me. He was in payroll, wasn't it, Izzy, you told me? <laughs> and so my brothers went into the services. My brother-in-law, Izzy, wasn't served. We were talking about the other evening, where my brother Gilly would come over to his house and, with my sister Jen and... Gilbert always complained about the food, the food apparently, but as he said, he cleaned off his dishes. And the rest of the kids stayed in Ottawa. They were still youngsters. Some teenagers, but youngsters. Irving had the responsibility. He was an excellent student, by the way, and a great son, good athlete. And after his studies at school and after he played his football or his basketball, he'd come home and he knew his other responsibility, helping his dad and mom. And on the sunny days, he was out in our big yard. Or in the colder days, he was in that basement without the concrete floor, sorting jute bags and onion bags and cotton bags because they had to save up for that next load. And Irving knew that had to be done. My sister Grace, for those of you who don't know her, she was an attractive woman, bright, lovely figure, 
she was a young ballet dancer. Somehow, with all those difficult times, my mother and father scraped enough money up so Grace could take ballet lessons. The kid from Lower Town. And after a short period of time, she excelled. She could no longer learn in Ottawa. She was better than the tutors. And she went to Montreal bi-monthly for her lessons. And on one of her return trips, she said to my mom and dad, I want to open a ballet school. Well, some of you fellas, I know when you see my wife and I at the ballet, you say, where does your culture come from? Well, listen carefully. <laughs> I always said I knew culture and ballet before you could spell it. Well, where was the ballet school going to be? They certainly could have put one to buy a building or rent one. And so my mother was very decisive. We had a living room dining. It was a combined one room or a rectangular shaped room. And my mother took all of our furniture, you can imagine, the quality of furniture, and out it went. And in came Mr. Applebaum, one of the Jewish carpenter contractors in Lower Town. And he was directed to put up a full length mirror along this double length room, floor to ceiling, a bar, and my mother and Grace went up and bought a small recorder. And so opened the Grace Greenberg Ballet School, 370 Clarence Street, La Pose Ville. And I can remember the smiles on my mother's and brothers and sisters' faces. We saw youngsters coming in from Rockcliffe, the so-called comfortable neighborhoods, the Glee, the West End, that's where Harvey Glass was raised, the comfortable area. And they were coming to Clarence Street to learn from Grace Greenberg, ballet. You know, she was good enough, they say, to go to New York and dance with the Ballet Russe. And she threatened to leave home, to run away, if she wasn't given that opportunity. As a matter of fact, she tried once, but didn't, <coughs> didn't succeed. But my father and my mother, good, solid immigrants with basic values, said, no New York. Not for her, he's a girl. The bright lights of New York had too many other invitations. And Grace's dancing career grinded to a halt. And then it was myself, I was the youngest. In those days, I only had one thing to claim. I was known as Keller Greenberg. <laughs> <laughs> now they say that they, I was given the name because I was an aggressive, somewhat tough kid, that I led the French gangs against fellow French neighborhoods. We were always victorious. The kids in Sandy Hills gave us great respect under the leadership of Keller Greenberg. And the Jewish kids still remind me today that some of them had difficulty, unless I gave them permission to cross Anglisi Square, <laughs> to get a cater. Well, as I thought of it over the years, I wasn't really a killer Greenberg. That was the early demonstrations of my leadership. <laughs> what other Jewish kid take all these Frenchmen, band them together and, and, you know, control the lower town area, the turf. <laughs> and then, 1945, happy days hit the Western world. The Second World War comes to an end. My two older brothers return from the services. Lou goes back to sales, back to selling cars at Myers. And my brother Gilbert tells my father about other junk dealers that he saw during his travels in the Air Force who were taking these rags. And rather than selling them to a Baker Brothers type of organization, they were turning them into a thing called wipers. They were taking these old rags, these filthy old rags, putting them through some kind of a laundering process, he explained to them, putting them through a procedure where they cut off the trimmed ends and the buttons and the zippers. They packaged them in fancy looking cart cartons and they sold them to industry, the corner garages, the service station, the EB Eddies, because these people who worked in this oily, dirty business needed something to wipe their hands. And they were using wipers. Well, they discussed it with my brother Irving, who was now to get to be a little <coughs> bit older and my mother and within a merit of a days, I think it was, <coughs> the name Sterilized Wiper, an industrial bag company, was formed. There was no great capital expenditure. The plant took place in the backyard of 370 Pine Street in that barn. Part of this barn was set aside for the storage of the bags, which remained part of our business, to be shipped to Montreal. And on the back portion of it, Mr. Applebaum again comes into the picture. He builds this plant. 
Oh, it was somewhere between maybe 20, 25 feet long and 15 feet wide. And in it, we had an industrial washer, a large, large washer. We had dryers that were called tumblers, an extractor, which wrung the water over the rags at a high speed after the washing cycle. And then they were in, into the next process, which was on cutting machines. We had young men and women on these cutting machines, cutting and trimming. Boy, we were really expanding. We brought in fancy curtains from the carport box suppliers, and we were starting to ship, and primarily at the beginning in the Ottawa area. E.B. Eddy was one of the major buyers, and a lot of the local merchants who owned garage shops and automobile supply businesses were the buyers. And we also had a small experience with sugar bags. You see, in the early days of peddling, when my dad brought home the loads, my mother really couldn't afford to go out and buy new sheets and pillowcases and you know, tea towels. <coughs> they were expensive. And so my mother came upon the idea of taking these sugar bags. They were light cotton, white in color, but always with red and blue print on them. She would put them through her regular wash machine at home and process them into usable items. We slept on sugar bags as pillowcases. Our sheets were sugar bags. Our dish towels were sugar bags. And my mother, my brother, my mother reminded my brothers and said, quite possibly this should be one of the products you sell. And that became one of the major items that we sold. We became rather sophisticated. We became merchandisers. And they were washed. We learned how to take the rich, dark, deep blue and red dyes out of the sugar bags and made them pure white. They were wrapped. They were folded. They were put in these nice small little cartons, 25 per carton. I know I had to count a lot of them. And they were shipped to the major supermarkets that once put my dad out of business. The commodity went across Canada. As a matter of fact, in later years, we tried to go into the American market. And we did with some success, but my brother Gilbert was the individual who went down with his wife, and they had kids, and it was just too difficult, and they came back home and kept building the local business. But in those middle 1940s, my sister Grace becomes a salesperson. They were called the salesmen then. Her ballet days were over. And as I said, she was attractive. She was bright. She had the qualities of being able to sell this product. I don't know if she was the only saleswoman around, but I can guarantee you she was the only one selling rags and bags. That I can guarantee you. And then, Grace was somewhere around 20 at this time. I want to tell this little tale. My mother was concerned. Grace was not married. She was all of 20 or 21, can you imagine? The fear of being, a, being an old maid. Do you remember that expression? And my mother, what did she want? Well, she wanted either a rich man or a doctor or a combination of both. But how could you attract that to Clarence Street? The one thing I didn't tell you about Clarence Street, I sort of dismissed it intentionally, but everyone in Clarence Street had rats. It was just part of the neighborhood, you see? No concrete floors, old homes, rotten wood, all the ingredients of bringing rats. But we were lucky. We had big rats. You know, if they had rodents like that, we had rodents like this. Because my father stored all those bags. And they loved the old feed. But we had tomcats, by the way. They kept us up all night with their screaming and screeching. But they kept the rats under control. But that wasn't the place to bring that kind of suitor. And so my mother insisted, and my father didn't have much of an argument against it, decided that we had to move to a better neighborhood. And guess where we end up? Island Park Drive. Can you imagine the leap? You have to roll back the clock and picture the city. Clarence Street, rags, bags, rats, Island Park Drive. And we bought the home of a former deputy minister, assistant deputy minister of the federal government. Grace did marry a doctor, by the way. It was a successful move. <clears throat> Just about that same time, this very fine gentleman I was telling you about, Mr. Louis Baker, Harvey Glass' father, grandfather, excuse me, had a great fondness for my brother Gilly and respect my father, or a mutual respect for that peddler who came in. And he saw this wiper business being launched, and he asked if he could become a partner of the Greenbergs. Well, you can imagine the excitement in our home. Fine, fine family, large scrap dealer, knowledge of the business, and supposedly comparable. Well, he was a welcome partner. And the partnership began. And one of Harvey's uncles, Uncle Jack, one of Louis' sons, became 
the operating son on his father's behalf. Well, the partnership worked, but it didn't work for very long. You see, shortly after we were working together, Mr. Baker saw that the opportunity for expansion was, was quite, quite good. And he turned to my dad and my brothers and said, I'm going to provide to you an empty lot I have, which wasn't very far from his scrapyard. It was in the Booth Street area, the lower Booth Street area. And you can have that. You don't have to put any cash in it. That'll be a portion of my capital investment in the business. And you can build a new plant and you can expand. Well, my brothers and my fathers were very excited by it. And they came home and told my mother. But Rochel wasn't that easily persuaded. She said, I want to look at the site. And so the story goes, they brought my mother down to the empty lot and she looked at it and she said, well now, Kendra, tell me what's going to take place. Tell me the form. Tell me the shape. What's going to take place on the site? Well, they said, Mom, you know, my dad said, Rochel, well, we're going to build a rectangular building. It's going to be so wide, so long. And my mother said, well, hold on. Where are the windows going to be? Well, they said there's going to be windows in the front door on the front, and there are going to be windows on the back. My mother said, and what about side windows? What about fresh air? And they said, well, the, the municipal bylaws don't permit side windows. You're too close to the lot lines. My mother said, with rags and bags and that dirt and that disease, no cross ventilation. She said, I can't accept this lot. And they said, but Ma, it's not costing us any money. Mr. Baker's making the investment. He's our partner. Huh, my mother said, Oi's partnership. That's the end of it. She says, we'll manage without Mr. Baker, without his lot, with all, all, all the resources. We will manage. We will, we will progress. And so that very nice relationship came to a halt. And things did progress. Somewhere around 1950-51, somebody's misfortune became our good fortune. The late Harold Copeland, who owned a major plant in Hull, which supplied war supplies to the Canadian Armed Forces, unfortunately went broke. And part of his establishment, there was a small plant built of brick and concrete blocks at the corner of Loire and Bergerapin and Wrightville, part of Hull. And my dad and my brothers made that acquisition. <coughs> and that gave them a great opportunity to expand. I mean, here was a full-fledged plant. We could now go out and we could buy the appropriate kind of equipment, a lot of storage room. And my brothers and my fathers learned very rapidly how to become true merchandisers and marketers. And all of their products went from coast to coast. But Transfer tractor trailers and trucks were coming regularly, daily. And I was the kid working in the plant as the kid brother in the back and loading the trucks and unloading them. And we were buying some of our raw materials, by the way, from J.C. Levinson, who was near this evening. His father, Morris Levinson, ran a salvage yard. But the local dealers couldn't keep us in supply. That's how good things became. And so unaware to most local people, we were importing rags from the USA, from Baltimore primarily. And these came in by freight train, full loads. And we used to have to go and unload them with our hands and wheelbarrows. And business continued. My father became slightly more clever there as well. You see, we weren't now just going to sell bags by grade one, two, and scrap, as my father did when he was a peddler. But we now learned that you could get a larger return on the bags if you sorted them differently. First of all, you had to clean them. You had to vacuum them with a large vacuum cleaner, which we purchased. Went through the roof. And then you sort into grades and sizes. So there was 20, 22, 24, 26, and 28 inch width bags. And there were different ounces, 8 ounce, 10 ounce, depending on the size of the ounce. And where they were marketed, the price increased. And so we became rather sophisticated. But my father called his sons aside one day and made the following declaration. He said, I want to ensure that every dealer who brings a load of bags into this plant gets an honest count and an honest grade. He said, I hugged the highway for too many years, always worried, will I get a fair count in Montreal? And you ensure that every dealer who comes in this yard gets that count. Well, I can tell you, not only did they, they get a fair count, all of the years through New York history, everyone got a fair count. In the early 1950s, another stroke of good fortune, um, somebody else's misfortune, the Red River. 
overflows. And Winnipeg is an endangered community. People's lives are in danger. Society wasn't sophisticated enough in those days, and they didn't have sufficient dikes to hold back the floodwaters. And so sandbags, a very primitive way of holding back waters, were called upon. And there weren't sufficient quality and quantities of bags in the West, and so they required more bags. And one of Grace's contacts in the government, a person agent, called Grace one day and said, your bag division, can it supply sandbags to the West? And she said, well, I have to check with my older brother, Gilbert. And she phoned Gilbert and said, Gilbert, can we supply? And Gilbert said, say yes. <laughs> but she said, Gilly, what they want is one source that's going to supply all of the bags from Eastern Canada. Now, we had maybe two or 3,000 bags in stores at this time. And Gilbert said, say yes. <laughs> and so she said yes, and we were awarded the contract. Well, you can imagine, that little plant with very little inventory was going to supply sandbags to protect Winnipeg against the Red River. And so very quickly we had to organize. I was about 17 years of age. And my brothers got on the phone with my father and they started calling the various dealers in Ontario, London, Windsor, Toronto, other communities, into the Quebec market where they knew a lot of dealers and looked for others and started to tell them that we were going to be buying up all their quality, quantity of bags but they had to meet certain, certain criteria. <coughs> and my brother Lou, who was still a salesman at that time, and Myers was hauled out of Myers, willingly I must say, and decided he was going to join his dad and brothers on this quick mission. And we undertook the delivery of hundreds of thousands of bags to the West. Your dad, Lawrence and David, he was shipped with my brother Irving to Windsor, London, Toronto. They were the center, central gathering point of the Ontario collection. And their bags were shipped by air transport into Winnipeg. I was with 17 and I was chaperoned by late, my late session on best. I need some control. And I was shipped to the Montreal area. I was to load out of Montreal. But I wasn't supposed to be, this is interesting, I wasn't supposed to be an industrial bag representative. He imagine at 17 years old, I was going to be a government representative. And why a government representative? Because you see, some people in that industry had a habit, the windfall story came, they might shortchange the criteria, the specs. So we were concerned about two things. Would these Quebec dealers, A, give us the right count, which we had to be accountable for, because we were the shipper, and B, was the quality going to be there? Were they going to be free of holes? So when they went to load them in Winnipeg, the sand wouldn't sift through. And so I was given very strict direction by my brothers and dad. And that. You ensure that the count and the quality are there. And here I was, this young fellow, telling my work for the government of Canada, and every so often I'd spot check. I'd have a bale opened up or a bundle opened up, and I'd check the count and I'd check the quality. And ours went by freight train. Well, after the shipments were completed, firstly, we received no complaints. The industrial bag had pulled it off with great respect. And the check came in, and that was a handsome reward. It paid off a lot of the family debts <laughs> and some of the old debts. <coughs> and there was a few dollars left over for some profit. So they sound like good days. But there must have been some discussion taking place between my mother and my father that we weren't aware of because one day in 1954, my dad walked into our factory in Hull and again called his son to aside and said, I don't think this business is any longer for you fellas. And they looked up at him. He said, the opportunities of making good money aren't really there. You're all going to be married one day. The only person married at that time was Gilly. You're going to get married. You're going to have families. And we won't be able to support that kind of expansion. And he said, secondly, and probably more importantly, he was concerned about the disease factor. And so he said, I want you to go into the real estate and the development business. <coughs> and they looked at him with amazement. But dad, he said, well, I look around, there are a lot of people out there making good money, buying and selling real estate, doing some building. It's clean. It seems a lot easier than what we're in. But dad said, but we, my brother said, but dad, we don't have any money. We don't have any knowledge. And this was in Jewish, and my father's part said, well, that's right. But with money, it doesn't take any brains. You kids have a lot of brains. He said, well, look around the auto area. You've got more brains than most of them. And knowledge you'll pick up. Well, my mother agreed with them. But there was some discussion between my brothers at the time. And so the next short period of time, in a very quiet 
unassuming way, my father went up and he purchased two six-unit apartment buildings, maybe the maximum quarter of a mile away from our plant in Hull. They were what they called jerry-built, weren't well-built, but they were new. They were financed under the central mortgage and housing programs. And anything that could go wrong in an apartment certainly went wrong there. The doors didn't hang well, the furnace didn't work. But shortly after their acquisition, my father sold them. They're called flips nowadays. And my father made a handsome profit. Told my brothers, but he was delighted. They said, oh, Dad's a, you know, an aberration, it's a fluke. Oh, my father said. Meanwhile, he was looking at another set of property to look at, and he went and acquired a five-door row in Centertown. Fully rented, it was tearing itself. And he sold it. And uh, another profit. And so my brothers learned very rapidly, hey, maybe Dad was right. And they decided maybe they weren't going to go into the development business, in the real estate business. But the truth was they needed some money. <clears throat> there wasn't any you know, Parazo and Bouchard magic wand involved. <clears throat> and so they went to their bank, the Bank of Montreal, which was located directly across the street from Parliament Hill. They put on their nice sport jackets, got over their peddling clothes, went to visit their bank manager, and he greeted them warmly, told them about their plans, and he said, you know, gentlemen, we've had a good relationship with you. Well, if you need an extra $15,000 or so to buy a new truck or some new equipment for your plant, no problem. But if you want to go into a new business called real estate and development, uh-uh. You don't know anything about it. It's risky. It's volatile. We're going to have to turn you down. And so my dad and my brother walked out of the bank and they started talking. They heard about another bank, the Toronto Dominion, the corner of Bank and Sparks at the time. There was supposedly a nice gentleman there a manager was open to the entrepreneurial spirit. And they had a few blocks to walk, and so they walked down. They walked in, and the manager was available, and they went in and met him. And he listened very carefully. And he said, well, how much money are you gentlemen looking for? And I don't know if it was a prefixed amount or not, but I knew the amount they asked for. They said $40,000. He said, no problem. He said, but I do want to see that last financial statement you were talking about. And he said, necessary, I'll go to Toronto and I'll speak to head office, but I'll get you that loan. And in 1995, the TD Bank is still the bankers of the Minto Corporation. Well, Minto was born, the birth of Minto. But there were a few new partners. First of all, my brother Lou. business without all the sons in and equal. And so Lou was brought over from the car sales business and he became an equal partner with my father and my brothers. And then a cousin of mine, the late Mike Greenberg, a highly respected lawyer in the city at the time. That's Stevie Greenberg's father for those of you who don't know him. He was very familiar with the mortgage and the development business and he loved our family. He liked Irving in particular. I remember as a kid when he used to visit us on Clarence Street. He used to come in, but the only kid he had money for was Irving. Irving always got the quarter. <clears throat> Anyways, Mike became a partner in the early years of Minto. And so, Minto made its start. Morris LaFortune was our first contractor. He was to build five doubles. We got the name from Mike. He knew a lot of the builders. We didn't know them yet. And he was contracted by ourselves to build five doubles, 10 sides. And anything that could go wrong went wrong in these homes. He was a heck of a fine guy, but he wasn't one we'd call a good builder. But we learned a great deal. It didn't cost us anything extra. He had to make those improvements at his cost. And halfway through the construction of those buildings in 1955, we sold our first home, somewhere in the $10,000 area. My father came home. It was a Thursday. Pupil's name was McAllister, I remember, because it was our first sale. And they had a very beautiful red-headed daughter. <laughs> I have to tell you that as well. And so my father came home that evening, and in Jewish, I can remember the conversation, because Irving and I were still single at home, and said, Rochel, the boys are going to witness success. We've sold our first home. 
I'm going to buy you a new engagement ring. You see, my mother gave up her engagement ring to my brother Lou during the Second World War when he married Helen. And he's, I'm going to buy you a new fur coat. Well, my mother knew her, she, she was fiery. She didn't want any ring, she didn't want any fur coat. You take that money, you reinvest it back in business, and let your children dress well. And so, no ring, no fur coat. And that Friday, my father passed away. Well, mental continued. And we knew, the brothers knew, that we couldn't rely on the, more, the fortunes any longer. If we were going to make any money, if we were going to be successful, we had to become the builders. And so that took place. Gilbert stayed in Hull. He managed all partners, by the way, but Gilbert stayed in Hull because the Hull plant was still bringing in his money. My brother Lou was going to be in charge of sales. Irving was going to win the Mike, you know, with Mike during the financing, the mortgage, the land, the development part of it. And I was the kid brother, and I was to monitor the construction, become the construction arm of the family. And as a collective unit, we didn't do too badly. In the first year, we built 115 units. Not bad, 1955. 114 doubles and three singles. Mind you, we did have a great electrician. Harry Goldstein's in the room. <laughs> Harry Goldstein was our first electrician. And I can tell you, I don't often tell this story, but the reason he got the job wasn't that he was such a great electrician. But in our days on Clarence Street, when my mother couldn't afford to pay electricians, him and his late brother did the electrical work. And on occasion he wasn't paid, and I understand on occasion he wasn't paid. And so when we did become villagers, my mother, my dear Ninska Zook, the election does on, Herschela. <laughs> and so Harry became a successful electrician. <laughs> well, when you get a little lower, I'll explain it to you. <laughs> oh, where? Oh, where? I'm sorry, Harry. I apologize. Most of them were in Heron, uh, in Heron Park. And the three singles, to refresh your memory, once were, was for Gilles Chenier, who worked for Mitchell and sterilized wipers since he was a, a t you know, teenager. The second was to his father. There was two easy sales. And the third was to a stranger. And the reason we went into singles because we knew doubles weren't the only way to go. And so we had three lively buyers and we put them up and sold them. And during those early years, Min Mitchell flourished. There was subdivision after subdivision. We went into rentals. We went into home sales. And things were looking up. Mother saw some success. Her kids were doing well. And in 1958, a week before our oldest child was born, my mother dies. But life goes on. We dug in our heels and we continued. And then mental thirst, large developments, Parkwood Hills, Bayshore, East End Developments. It went on and on. And in 1961, my oldest brother Lou, had, who had now had a few heart problems, decided that the rough and tumble, the long hours, the difficult battles that were necessary, the strategy meetings till all hours of the morning was no longer good for his health. He wanted to live a little longer. As a matter of fact, I can remember quite clearly in the parking lot, your dad saying to me, I want to live. I don't want to be a rich man with a gravestone over me. And so in 1961, Lou left and lived on a fairly leisurely life. In 1962, I made a similar decision, but for different reasons. I wasn't unhappy <coughs> with my brothers in the construction industry. It was fun. It was challenging. But I decided I wanted to become involved in community work, in public life. And so in 1962, I left the Mitchell Corporation. I came back shortly thereafter, but just for a year. My bre late brother Gilly became very ill with an unusual virus. And he was laid up and shipped to Montreal and back and forth, not knowing exactly what was wrong. And for a year, I stayed with the Mitchell, helping my brother reorganize and put things in place because it was just a little too difficult. Mitchell wasn't quite that mature yet, but staff and structure to help things get back on track. And then when Gilbert recovered, well enough to come back to work, I went back out into the community. But after we left, my brother Gilbert and Irving carried on. And they were one heck of a combination, I can tell you. Gilbert took after my father in character. He was mild-mannered, quiet-spoken, rarely raised his voice, easy to get along with, knew where he was going. My brother Irving, some say he shouted a lot. 
I think people were hard of hearing. He had to raise his voice on occasion. But Irving really took after my mother. He was fiery. He was aggressive. He was volatile. And he knew where he was going. And he told people where he was going. And one had to follow. And so the 60s were good years. And by the 70s, things continued to grow. My brothers were marketing people. They looked not just at Ottawa to see what was taking place. They looked at the markets around North America. They looked in Europe. They were always reading the financial pages of what was taking place. Take place all parts of the world because it had a direct effect in one way or another in our economy. And what changes were taking place? They were bright enough. They were wise enough. And so the 70s allowed them that opportunity to let their minds expand and grow. And they became the first builders in the city to build a condo unit in Parkwood Hills. My nephew Lawrence got involved with it in later years. And it also gave my brothers some time to now become involved in their own community work. You see, Minto has now become slightly more organized. The quality of the staff was improving regularly. The structure was in place. And my brothers started to take some time off from their work, and they got involved in the community. Gilly became involved in the Jewish community. And Irving took on a more national interest. <coughs> and for a slight while, you might remember, he became a socialist in Trump stage in his life. But the thing I remember most about my brother Irving, the quiet one, he was standing, we didn't know about this, but we were opened up television one night, and there was my brother Irving with a placard. He was boycotting the prime minister in his group at the time, yelling, Biafra, Biafra, Biafra. You see, Irving was one of those fellows who always wanted to fight for the underdog. But Minto was still the main focus. And by the end of the 1970s, we were well enough organized as an organization that my brothers launched into the Florida market with a very substantial acquisition. And by this time, with thousands of units built across this Ottawa Carlton region, housing units predominantly, Minto was now known as Ottawa's largest and most successful home builder. Shortly after that acquisition, my brother Gilly passes away. And now Irving is alone at the helm. But Irving did for his brother what Gilbert would have done for his brother. All of Gilbert's, Gilbert's children took over the shares of Irving Greenberg, became full owners of the Mitchell Corporation, and till this very day owned half of the corporation. And yet, some of them were much too young to work. They were still in school. A few of them were getting a little bit older. And Irving realized that these young fellas who he took under his wing had to be groomed because one day they were going to have to assume the responsibilities of Minto. And so he did it and with a great deal of love. He was hard on them at times, but with great love. And those 80s were good years for our Western society. The Canadian economy was flourishing. It, it was bubbling. And Minto went along with the success. Home sales increased. We were now in Florida. Toronto opened up. And my brother Irving was getting bored with housing. And so he decided, let's try the commercial market. And so he ventured off, started with a few small developments to get the feel of it, because we were a hands-on operation. My brother went downtown and, with his organization, built the Carlisle Building, which is a combination residential commercial building on Laurie Avenue. A rather substantial looking building. And then, Minto Place, directly across the street. Now let me tell you something about the Greenberg style, the hands-on approach. You see, Minto at this time had architects, planners, lawyers, you name it, all the disciplines were in place. Excellent staff, top superintendents, good suppliers, good trades. But that wasn't quite enough. There were two elements to this new undertaking, which was going to be the largest single program ever built by a private sector owner in the city. And so my brother was going to build three components to this complex, three towers. Two were going to be commercial office rental spaces, and one was, one was going to be a hotel, and hotels he had no experience with. And so first of all, his office and the construction site had to be moved out of the head office and Baxter Center and moved downtown where he could keep an eye on it. And so right across the street from the new excavation 
On Laurie Avenue, where Mitchell Place is, my brother opened up a construction site. It wasn't a usual trailer. He took over, I think it was half the floor, of the Carlisle building, the main floor, and opened up a construction office. His office close to the window, I understand, so he could look over the, the site when he wasn't walking it. And his architects and planners could be there, so changes could be made on the site. We weren't that sophisticated. We had to send back that office for memos and intermemos to make changes. That building had to get up. It had to be profitable. But the hotel story is an interesting one because he knew nothing about hotels, but he knew he, he had to build a quality hotel. It had to be up to the 90s, and, and, you know. And so he said to his wife, Shirley, who was here this evening, I saw her walk in, that they were going to take a trip. And Shirley thought another holiday. And so she was told to pack a couple of suitcases, which apparently she did. But what she didn't know, in my brother's briefcase, was a measuring tape and a notepad. And they traveled, all right, from city to city, but each night they were on the move because what they were really looking at was hotel accommodation. And the features all these different hotels in various cities were offering. They were measuring washrooms, kitchens, shapes of living rooms, dining rooms, what kind of high-tech equipment they required. And they came back with folders of what they thought would be important elements to this new structure. And they turned it over to their professional people who worked at it into their organization. Now, I'm sure there was much more to that story, but that was to demonstrate to you that even with all the sophistication, with all the success, with all of these instruments around you and the personnel, that Greenberg hands-on approach was still very effective. Well, it was a success story, so it's hard to knock. And by the end of the 1980s, with all these owner-occupied homes, all these rental units, and its commercial developments, Minto had its own quiet way, and its conservative way, had built sufficient accommodation to house the entire population of Kingston, Ontario. And in 1990, I lose my last brother, my brother Irving. And without any fanfare, and just as Irving had planned and organized, <laughs> so that Minto could be passed on to the next generation. Passing over took place. And Michael was in Florida handling the Southern operations. Alan was in Toronto at this point handling the Toronto operations. And my nephew Roger, Gilly's middle son, who had become president, was operating the Ottawa and the head office operation with his brother Robert as vice president. Will they be successful? Will they carry on? The answer is a unequivocal, simple yes. And what will be the story of Rose and Roger Greenberg's 24 grandchildren? As the father of five and the uncle of 19, I look at homemakers, lawyers, developers, businessmen, businesswomen, medical doctors, psychologists, research scientists, social workers, nurses, artists, and media people. And one former soldier of the Israeli army during the Yom Kippur War, Sergeant Michael Greenberg, Gilly's son, who came home safely and now handles the floor of operation. And I know that they will all be successful in all their endeavors. They will all make contributions to their community because all of these children have in great measure the qualities that made for the Roger and Greenberg story. As I was preparing for this evening, I was going through the Jewish Bulletin and I said to myself, if all oh, my mother and father were alive, the joy they would have had of reading this particular edition. There was Lawrence, the president of the Vaud. My brother, my nephew, Roger Gilbert's young boy, president of the Mitchell Corporation, heading up with Stevie Greenberg, the major fund raising campaign to build our new Jewish campus. And there was their surviving child, Killer Greenberg, the first Jewish mayor 
the nation's capital, having the distinct pleasure of telling you the Rose and Roger Greenberg story. Thank you. Melinda. Well, okay. Lawrence, it was no, an no, hour and nine minutes. No, it's not too bad. No, no, no. I was telling them on the way to Castro, I would have taken about four. <laughs> it was very, very interesting. Now, if there are questions from the floor, we'll take them and we'll entertain them. Please, if you have questions, come forward. Harry, you have the question. I'll leave Jacob alone. Yes. The question was, why did my grandfather, that would have been my father's father, who none of us knew, his name was Isaac, Isaac, why did he and his children come to this land, and why Ottawa? I can't honestly tell you. My cousin Mervyn says he knows. Mervyn is the official in-resident expert of our family tree. Mervyn, you want to stand up, please? And uh, why did our grandfather and fathers come to America? came with the general immigration to escape the programs. Yeah, but why Canada and why Ottawa was the question, Murph? Okay, have a seat, Murph. <laughs> I said like thousands of other immigrants, they came to the shore of Canada, the land of milk and honey, the land of opportunity, the land of choice. But they didn't tell us why and where. Oh, I didn't research that, right. There must have been some early relatives, yeah. Well, well, one of the first to arrive was his older brother, Laser. And, uh, but, you know, to tell you that and not answer the question fully, you know, wouldn't be right. I don't know why. You see, I can tell you this. I went over the 1920s rather rapidly because the stories in our home didn't spend much time on pre-1933. We knew about my father's illness. We knew about St. Andrew. We knew what Billings Bridge and a few stories out there. We knew of all our relatives, relatives you know, Fletcher Laser and me, Mester, his wife. We knew some very scant stories, but, you know, what my dad did other than Petter, we never really knew. We knew he got hit in the stock market. But the stories really began in 1933, that special event. I was born. <laughs> That's when life really took off. <coughs> Yes, the story in Billings Bridge was in very early uh, 1920s by my brother, my father's brother, Laser, who owns uh, a general store. As a matter of fact, Mervyn and I knew about that. I don't remember it very well, but I, I knew about it. And my cousin Mervyn and I, who were talking about this evening, uh, Mervyn reminded me, and I did, did remember that as well, that Mervyn, as a young teenager, worked in that general store for his uncle, um, the Laser. By the way, you know, Mervyn, who was the child of my uh, dad's middle brother, Mervyn was born after his father's death. His mother was carrying Mervyn, and uh, his father passed away as a young man. I beg your pardon? Well, he only wanted to become a relative when we became successful. <laughs> More lawnsmen than relatives. More lawnsmen than relatives. <coughs> They, they, they would tail off in 5th, 6th, 7th, somewhere in that area. It was never, you know, fully explained to us, but we always had a great affection for that family. My mother and dad were very close to his parents, but they... They came from the same area. Yeah, they came from the same area in Russia, and they were more, more lawnsmen than natural relatives. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, when we became prosperous, a lot of people became our relatives. The same <laughs> as when I became mayor, I went to school with all these people. It couldn't have been possible, as my nephew Lawrence said. I didn't attend very long. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Well, I, I was, uh, I have an apartment at the uh, Lindmore Village, which is right behind the township. And I've been there 17 years. When we first this is in Florida, folks. Right. When, I, when we first moved into that, into the apartment, all we could, we could see the cattle, cattle grazing in, in the distance. That was before, before Lindo just started, I think. It probably started just shortly after, after that year. We bought our property in 1978. So this That's right. 17th winter. That's right. We watched every year, every year, growing, growing, first to uh, build up to Holmes Road, and then to Sapper Road, and then beyond. My question is, at this point, curiosity killed the cat. Well, don't die. <laughs> not, 
how many units? How many units I saw this year? I'm just wondering how many units have I seen so many buildings go up? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, this gentleman, the question was, he says that he's lived, resided in Florida for some 17 years, and he was residing near one of the, well, not near one of the, the first major operation the Mentron took called the Township in Florida. And over the last 17 years, he watched success, and he saw them grow from one large area to the other. And he asked how many units were built. Well, Sitton's never told Eaton's, let me tell you that to begin with. I never quite told you other than by the numbers of people who lived in Kingston. You'd have to do your own, you know, so in cap per house. Yeah, my nephews are giving me signals. <laughs> but I can tell you two things about that op operation and answer so that the rest of the public who don't know about the development can understand. Minto was one of the leading developers in southern Florida. Not the leading one, but one of the leading ones. And they're certainly one of the finest builders. It all belongs to the Minto Corporation. It's part of the head office, part of the Toronto and Auto operation. It's operated by Mark and earlier with his brother Kenny. And it has built thousands of units. I'll give you a little tip because we don't do it often. Both my nephews were saying the same number, so I know that the present count is right. Michael and his organization have put up 5,000 units in Florida. Very in the township. In the, was that in the township, was it? Just the township. And so, in our own humble way, many thousands. Well, in Platina, you have 900. Bay Pern? In Platina, you have about 900. You, you live in Platina, Harry? Did you get a family discount? <laughs> so my nephews didn't give you a family in discount, family. Harry. I'll make sure if it was Robert in particular. He likes you. Oh, oh, of course, of course, of course. I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. As I look over, yes, I saw. <laughs> well, there were no poor. As a matter of fact, it was up in their farm area that my oldest uh, brother uh, had that tragic accident, and their and their father was my father's best buddy. And but my father went up to visit their dad just before he passed away, or they thought he was going to pass away. My father went to visit him and said, Nathan's very sick. And he came home and told my mother he was terribly disturbed, and my father died, Nathan lived on. We had a visit from, uh, from Gilbert back in, I think, in the uh, 60s, I believe, a visit my cousin, my cousin Sam Bonovich. I had, had, had the pleasure of meeting him. <clears throat> that, that would have been back in the uh, 70s. Yeah. Are there any other questions? <laughs> well, once again, on behalf of my mother and my father and all of the Greenbergs and all of the grandchildren, thank you for this wonderful opportunity and thank you to your society. Thank you, Laurie. I'll have Dr. Ma uh, Marcus Hotz come forward to thank the speaker. Mr. Chairman, I never expected, knowing Laurie as well as I do, a dispassionate d address in history of the Greenberg family. And, of course, we didn't get one. Uh, this fascinating account kept me going back and thinking about Jewish immigration and immigration to the new countries, to Canada, to some extent to the United States, to some extent. My grandfather was one of those who uh, decided that the United States was not for him and ended up in South Africa. So, <laughs> uh, this story of the Jewish success is a fascinating one, and it's a particularly fascinating one because it's generally built on, one, on two factors. One is very close family and close family ties, which you heard about this evening, and the other is hands-on management. Everybody was involved, everybody was into it, and everybody was working in it. So this fascinating story, I think, just highlights how the Jews have in fact adapted, uh, overcome all their trials and tribulations, and, um, and made a success of things. Laurie, thank you very much. And a small token from the Society of the I must tell you, his wife, during my early political years, was a, not, only a, not only an acquaintance, but one of my great advisors in the field of social work and the delivery of care to those who were needed in our uh, city, in our region. Very fine lady. Thank you, Laurie. This is the end of the evening. There are refreshments at the back of the hall. Thank you.